Deep field images of outer space make it seem as if galaxies and gas are randomly splashed across the universe. But for decades, astronomers have been mapping out a vast network of roads and hubs made of a mysterious substance known as dark matter that scaffolds the cosmos. They call this network the Cosmic Web. I'm really excited today to be talking to two guests from one of my favorite institutions, the American Museum of Natural History. We have Mordecai Mark Macklow. He's the curator in and chair of the museum's Department of Astrophysics. And Carter Emart, who is the director of astrovisualization at the museum. Welcome and thank you both for talking to me. Well, you guys both have a lot of specializations in all sorts of fascinating topics. I wish we could have a week to talk about them, but um, we're actually gonna go to the biggest of the big in terms of space and the universe uh, with this fascinating superstructure known as the cosmic web. Um, so, you know, you say that word, it sounds like some new agey networking or something like that. Could we just start there if, if, if Mordecai, you wanted to tell us a little bit about this amazing, huge structure of the cosmic web? When the universe was very young, it was shortly after the Big Bang. It was extremely smooth to parts in 100,000 or better. And the lumpy, bumpy universe that we know now with planets, stars, galaxies, people. None of that existed. There were no stars, there were no planets, there were no galaxies. Everything was uniform, smooth, evenly distributed. So any small perturbation, any small increase or decrease in density allowed gravity to start drawing towards the higher density regions and pushing away from the lower density regions so that the dark matter started to become non-uniform. And those very small changes in how much stuff was at any particular place were the seeds for what eventually grew to be the cosmic web. And the cosmic web, the structure of the dark matter as it falls together, then forms the skeleton for the distribution of galaxies, stars, planets. So, yeah, so it's these tiny fluctuations early in the universe. Now it's 13 odd billion years later. How big is this structure now? Like how, uh, what does it look like on the universal scale? The largest uh, regions in the web are of order a couple hundred million, well, 600 million light years across. Wow. So they're huge. There are multitudes of galaxies in the walls of any piece of the web, but they are finite scale because the universe has only had, has only had 13 and a half billion years for things to collapse into this structure. It will continue to evolve as the universe moves into the future. And if we moved, say, a trillion years from now, the web would look very different than it looks now in the infancy, only 13 and a half billion years after the Big Bang. And you know, Carter, you do these amazing astro visualizations. Um, something like the cosmic web is kind of esoteric, you know, it's not as easy for the public necessarily to imagine as a planet is. So um, could you talk a little bit about how you have imagined and uh, communicated the kind of visual extent and the complexity of these structures. So these deep surveys, you know, measure these galaxies going way out. And so when you step outside a galaxy, which, you know, a galaxy has typically a couple hundred billion stars, you know, and perhaps trillions of planets in it. And then it has this dark matter components and all this kind of stuff is, is that that these galaxies, when we back off and when we show this, they're really these tiny little points. And so mm -hmm. what we end up with is, is just like, you know, looking at a city from space, you just see lots of little lights, is that these lights map out where the action is and where the matter is. And so <laughs> where it matters. So um, <laughs> in this way, we can really kind of see this large scale structure and we can actually sort of explore it, plug through it, talk about it, 
It's so fascinating too, because, you know, you mentioned these galaxies, from what I understand, these galaxies, they're, they're sort of like the nodes of the of this web. And then there's these filaments. Yeah, the galaxy clusters are at the nodes because that's okay. where the most mass is. But you can find, you do find galaxies even in the voids, in the volumes enclosed by the web, but many, mm -hmm. many, many fewer, smaller, dimmer. It's just not, it's, it's the outskirts. Whereas the filaments, the sheets, Mm -hmm. are, there are, are traced by galaxies, and then there are concentrations of galaxies in the nodes. So it's sort of, are they like kind of bridges across space where you have like well, a... What it actually is, is more, you can think of it more like a soap bubble or a set of soap bubbles. Okay. Um, so the sheets in the web are like the sheets of soap bubbles, and then the galaxy clusters come where multiple sheets intersect. Um, uh -huh. First, well, first you'll get filaments, which are lines where two sheets intersect. And then when two filaments intersect, you get a node. It seems like uh, the our understanding of the cosmic web and our understanding of dark matter and dark energy have been kind of evolving in tandem and they all uh, interlock with each other. So um, how is this kind of emerging field, how does it shed light on what dark matter might be? You can start to rule out possibilities for what the dark matter might be by comparing the results of simulations to the actual observations. The ones that match, that are consistent, you can keep those descriptions and look for that kind of dark matter. The ones that wildly don't match, you probably are going to disfavor those explanations. And so that's how we came to the cold dark matter theory, uh, which is the current theory of uh, cosmology, which is that dark matter moves much, much slower than the speed of light. And you need that in order to get the structure that we see. It, it seems Same like way. you're refining the physicist toolkit in, in a way of somebody like delivering a meal to you. And then you have to kind of figure out how the recipe was made. By, you know, <laughs> just looking at like the thing that's on the plate. Well, so it's it's obviously a pretty exciting time, both on the theory end and on the observation end, in terms of these subjects. I would, now, I would characterize it as being potentially as exciting as the period uh, just over a hundred years ago, when a few loose ends in classical physics ended up uh, yielding general relativity and quantum mechanics, which, of course, particularly quantum mechanics, form the basis for most of the our modern day technology and which were grew out of what initially appeared to be just very small problems that couldn't quite be solved with classical physics. Yeah, and this wonderful uh, film that you mentioned, the, the um, Hayden Planetarium space show, Dark Universe, um, kind of builds on all of this amazing research and brings it to a level that can resonate with the public with these fantastic visualizations. I'm just wondering, you know, what inspired the show? Was it was it this kind of surge of new interest in this or um, what was the sort of kernel behind that show? To some extent, it was inspired, I'm afraid, by a New York City public school teacher who I was walking through the museum, who quietly turned to me and said, do you really believe in this Big Bang stuff? <laughs> and I was like, well, no, I don't believe in it but I have an awful lot of observational evidence for it. And then I realized that most people don't know that the Big Bang is based on observational evidence. Mm -hmm. And so we set out to present the observational evidence and the tools with which we um, gathered that evidence. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's obviously so much thought that goes into how this will uh, best communicate these complex ideas. Um, Carter, can I ask what, how does this come together as a simulation? Like, are you sitting down at a computer doing uh, different programs? Like, what's the process actually like um, in terms of building this from the research? It's a it's a new field, really, this, this visualizing of these specialized simulations and to um, try to work within our team um, at the museum. And this is really editorially and, um, and and with our script writer, with our curators, with our scientists to actually hone this and adjust this over a production period of a year, essentially on the books. <laughs> it's 
longer than that if you think of you know, sort of uh, thinking about these things and, and uh, even uh, in the build up to the symposium where we invite everybody in. But when we have the symposium, we're generally, you know, it's sort of we have a notion and a rough storyboard in mind. Mm -hmm. We present that, but then it's very much affected by the scientists and, and that knowledge which is brought together in the symposium. I'm wondering what scientists around the world um, and researchers around the world of all fields are thinking about the future of how the cosmic web will evolve. Uh, Mordecai, you had described really well how it emerged in the early universe. We have an increasing sense of what it's like right now. Uh, what's going to happen a billion years, 10 billion years, you know, into the future? What happens is gravity continues to act. So the material continues to fall from the voids onto the sheets, from the sheets into the filaments, and from the filaments into the nodes, until really the voids are empty. There is no more material. Then the sheets start emptying out, and mm -hmm. finally the filaments fall onto the nodes, leaving the nodes as the really the only place where there's matter. That matter continues to collapse until ultimately we reach trillions of years into the future when the last stars burn the last hydrogen and they fuse the last hydrogen in their cores. These are the very smallest stars, the M dwarfs, the red dwarfs. After that point, it's all cooling and collapse. And if you go many trillions of years into the future, you actually get some crazy effects. Quantum tunneling, the ability of a particle to go from here to there without passing through the space in between, because there's some probability that it's over there and not here. If you wait long enough, even an entire star can quantum tunnel to its center and become a black hole. You have to wait many, many trillions of years, maybe quadrillions of years for that to actually happen, but it will happen eventually. And that appears to be the long-term fate of the universe, is everything quantum tunnels into either black holes or isolated photons that will never intersect anything else ever again. Well, obviously, we'll all be around at that point to see it for ourselves, so I'm looking forward to your visualizations of that, Carter. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know, that, that would be an interesting future show, you know, where's the universe going? <laughs> You know, the structure of these cosmic webs, they're really reminiscent of a lot of living structures like fungal networks or capillaries or neural networks and things like that. So at the risk of going kind of tinfoil here and uh, channeling some science fiction concepts where the universe is like a living entity. I mean, is there anything to be made of those similarities that you can see or is that just humans looking for patterns? So there's something to be made, but it's not exactly what one might think. And okay. the thing is that if you have dynamics that act more quickly in one direction than another, then you can get these sorts of soap bubble type structures. Um, and so some like cell growth patterns can do that. The resemblance to neurons, however, is a projection effect because neurons really are filaments. Whereas the cosmic web is sheets that are intersecting and forming denser regions. And so that, you do have neurons that have nodes and filaments, and the web has nodes and filaments, but the nodes of the web are where the intersect, are the intersections of the filaments rather than, than the growth points of the filaments. And the filaments themselves are the intersections of the sheets. So there, there's homeomorphy or self-similarity in, you know, in, in nature, as Mordecai's pointing out. What, I, what I, I, the kind of poetic justice I like to think is that that interconnection of our gray matter lets us understand dark matter. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's like, you know, again, it's this scaffolding of, of thought in a way is, is, is this amazing interconnectedness of, uh, uh, of our of this biological process and storage of information, um, but also you know in nature the storage of information is a, really this patterning of, of the universe we see. So we're not neurotransmitters in a giant universe brain, which is gives me some 
<laughs> well, at least not that we know of currently. Um, but yes. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it open. You know, we're still laying the foundations of this stuff. <laughs>